Hi, I'm here with a, uh, another video for my Bible study project. If you don't know, um, this is just my personal journey through the Bible. I am reading it um, not straight cover to cover. I'm reading a bit of the Old Testament each week and a bit of the New Testament each week. And by the end of the year, I should be have read the whole Bible. Um, and then I just come on here and share my uh, thoughts. So this week I read Genesis chapter 46 to Exodus chapter 13, um, and then I read Matthews chapter 13 to 16. So here are some thoughts. We'll begin with the Old Testament. Um, in Genesis 47, 21 to 31, um, previously before this, we saw Joseph actually saving the people living in Egypt from famine. But here we see kind of a reversal. He's still saving them, still giving them the food to eat, but he's taking things as well. Um, so the people come to him and it's been, you know, it's been seven years that they're in this famine, they kind of run out of money and said, here, take all our silver and gold and um, here, take all our herds and cattle and here, take all our land. And they eventually in that fashion become slaves to the Pharaoh. And this is done through Joseph. Um, you know, and it's even more interesting because we see um, Joseph who started out as a slave and then he becomes an enslaver, um, giving more and more to the Pharaoh and ended up enslaving his people. And so I was looking at, at why this was happening online. I saw a lot of people trying to justify this and it was kind of scary because it's like they're trying to justify slavery. And what we have to realize is that we can't always justify the actions of characters in the Bibles. These aren't um, people that are supposed to be role models. These are people who's lives are human, are flawed, and whose lives we're supposed to learn from. So even though, yes, Joseph, you know, ins was responsible for enslaving his people, um, you know, we shouldn't try to justify that. We should look at that and be like, that is not a good thing to do. Um, you know, learn from that mistake. And uh, then we move on to Exodus. Um, and now um, we begin Exodus learning that the Pharaoh is now afraid of his slaves. Um, especially that they're gonna become a majority and that they're gonna overthrow him and I couldn't help but link this to our modern times of course and how people are afraid of immigrants and afraid um, of people of a different color um, you know descendants of slaves in America um, and especially from countries that have been historically oppressed or currently oppressed by you know American countries um, immigrating to America and all of a sudden you're like, oh no, these people that we treated badly are coming. Um, we need to be scared, but you don't really um, at all need to be scared of immigrants. They're coming um, to seek safety and to um, seek a better life for themselves and to contribute to these countries that they're coming to. And then we get to the story of Moses specifically. And I'm going to admit, I was in the process of reading Exodus and I decided I want to watch the Prince of Egypt movie. And that's where I know the story of Moses from. And there's a lot more in that movie than there is in the book of Exodus, especially in regards to the childhood of Moses and how he grew up. Um, so in the movie, he grows up as a prince of Egypt. Like he, he's the second born. He's in a position of power. But in the book, he knows that he's Hebrew. Um, it's really quite interesting. Um, so in Exodus chapter 2 verse 5, um, Moses has already grown up. He's killed a man in Egypt, one of the guards, um, and he's fled um, and he started a new life um, with, a, uh, uh, with the family of a priest and he marries the daughter of Zipporah. But as he's shepherding, he um, gets called by the burning bush and the Bush is God talking to him, he says, take off your shoes, and I kind of wondered why, why do we take off shoes on sacred ground? And uh, the general consensus seems to be that in Egypt, that was tradition. Before you enter a holy space, before you enter a home, you remove your shoes because they're covered in sand and debris and stuff that, you know, we do, the reason we take off our shoes today because they're covered in gunk and you don't want to bring that into a place. Um, there's also symbolic meanings behind it, um, including, you know, a giving up of possessions. Um, a sign of respect um, and giving and giving of yourself completely to a place you're actually touching it with your with your skin Exodus chapter 3 verse 11 um, Moses uh, doubts himself when he, God gives him this mission to free the slaves he says but who am I who am I to do this 
he doubts his worthiness and we actually see this throughout Exodus you know Moses has a lot of anxiety um, especially in regards to public speaking he says in Exodus uh, chapter 4 verse 10 um, I am slow and hesitant of speech and God acknowledges that and he says listen I understand I'm not going to force you to speak what I'll do is I'll bring in Aaron your brother to speak um, for you and I thought that was really cool that that God acknowledged the anxiety and he didn't force him to work around the anxiety he provided a tool um, so that Moses was still able to do the job um, that was required of him but with the, with the assistance of someone else uh, still in chapter 4 of Exodus, verse 21, um, God says, I will harden his heart. And this is said in reference to making Pharaoh not want to um, let the Hebrews go. And I was wondering why did God want to make this such a difficult task for Moses by doing that? Um, and again, I found people trying to justify this and saying, oh, it's not really God doing it. Pharaoh's done it to himself. And I was like, but the text says, I will harden his heart. Um, and so we actually um, get the answer later on in Exodus chapter 10 um, verses 1 to 2 when God says that um, they did this so that they can show their power and provide a story um, for the people of Moses um, and to pass that story down and establish the strong beginning of a religion um, you know what you know that's a great origin story you people are freed from slavery and this is how they were freed through um, all these all these um, things being done, all this great power and miracles happening. Um, miracles for the Hebrew people, not for the Egyptians, obviously. Um, and if you read the text, it's very repetitive too, so it's it's um, easier to remember and it's it gets in there in your brain. So this da 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 da, -da makes it easier to remember and pass it along. Um, and it was also done, um, as it says in the text, to um, shake the faith of the Egyptians and their gods. And we actually see that happening, which is quite interesting in Exodus chapter 9, verse 20, um, when the hail is being sent down. Some Egyptians actually listened to the warnings and brought their animals and um, their slaves inside to protect them, and other Egyptians didn't. So it's really interesting. So we can't always try to justify the actions of God. Um, you know, we can't exa expect God to act in the way we want them to act. Um, you know, we can't pit our own morality on God, especially if the interpretation of the, the text isn't there. Uh, speaking of interpretation, uh, this was an interesting passage. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 24, um, I thought what the text was saying was that God was trying to kill Moses. And I was just like, hold up, you just gave Moses this task. Why are you now trying to kill him? Um, what's interesting is that um, I'll show the passages here. Um, it's might be just an issue of how the stories are spaced out in the text. That that part um, where it says God tries to kill him may actually have belonged to the previous story where God said he was going to kill um, the firstborn Pharaoh. It doesn't mean that he was going to kill Moses. Um, the story of Zipporah circumcising should be spaced down and be a different part of the story. So that's interesting. Um, and the last part from the Old Testament here, Exodus chapter 12 verse 15, um, the Hebrews are commanded to eat unleavened bread. And leavened bread is actually where a piece of um, sour or fermented dough is reserved for the purpose of leavening the, your bread from the previous day's baking. Um, so it takes some time. We can see this as a, as a symbol of leaving your past behind you. Don't take that previous day's bread with you um, to start anew, start fresh. But it could also be a practical, completely practical thing. Um, where the Hebrews were leaving and they didn't have enough time to leaven their bread. Um, so it's interesting that there's both that symbolic meaning there and the um, practical meaning there, as we saw with the shoes as well. Uh, and then we move on to the New Testament. Um, first I'm going to talk about um, Matthew chapter 13 verses 10 to 23, where Jesus actually provides instructions on how to analyze his parables. And we can take this and we can use that to analyze the text. Um, so some of his instructions are to open your eyes, open your ears, open your mind, um, and work to understand it. Don't just hear it, don't just read it, put the work in. Um, and don't immediately accept it because without accepting it, without looking at it, and without working with it, it doesn't actually stay with you. Um, but actually um, analyzing it and looking further into it, it stays with you more. And I found that with this, with this journey as well, that, um, you know, looking deeper into some of these texts and what they mean um, has helped me remember them better and understand them better. 
Um, and lastly, not only do we have to understand the text, but we have to show evidence that we've understood it through um, through our actions, we t that we've taken these messages into our lives. So an interesting thing um, that happens throughout Matthew um, are the Pharisees. Um, and I was asking who specifically are the Pharisees? Um, and they were a sect of the Jewish population that kept themselves separate from other Jewish people. Um, so their name actually means separation. And Jesus's main problem with them was that they teach as doctrines the commandments of men, uh, which is Matthew uh, chapter 15 verse 9. He says, you know, their traditions are not ordained by God and their made-up rules are not in the religious texts. Um, and we see a lot of this today still today um, as some people who, who call themselves uh, Christians hold up these moralistic and legalistic rules that have really no biblical basis or are, you know, big stretch um, of interpretations. Um, or even directly contradict the Bible. Um, then we have Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 to 28. This is one of my favorite stories. This is the story of the faith of the Canaanite woman. So the story is a woman, a Canaanite woman obviously, asks Jesus to heal her daughter and Jesus refuses and says you're a dog, you don't eat, f you know, you don't take food from the master's table um, away from the children. And uh, the woman says, well, even dogs can eat scraps from the master's table. And Jesus goes, hold up, you're right. You have faith, this is amazing. I'm no longer just here for the Israelite people, I'm here for everyone. Um, and if you remember in previous videos, I talked about the Israelites' disdain for the Canaanites. Um, and in this story, we see um, that Jesus is now including those enemies of the Israelites um, in his plan for salvation. Um, and this is one of my favorite stories because it shows Jesus changing. Um, and I think this is a great example of how human he is and how open he was to listening um, to other people. Uh, just in regards to this video, an interesting passage is uh, Matthew chapter 16, 12, where Jesus makes a call back to the leavened bread. Um, and this time he talks about this symbolic idea of it and he warns against the leaven of the, of the Pharisees. He warns against their teachings and their, their hold on tradition in the past. Um, so that was an interesting part just to include here. And the last passage from the New Testament is Matthew chapter 16 verse 19 um, where we see Peter established as the rock of the church and this um, verse specifically says whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven and this is a very significant phrase. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the legitimacy of the Catholic Church um, building upon this um, because that's a different interpretation. Um, but I found this interesting because uh, Jesus had just told in the previous thing um, the Pharisees that they were hypocrites for making up their own rules and laws that weren't based in the Bible. And here he's it's seemingly telling Peter that he, he has permission to now do that. Um, so I was like, why is Peter special? And what I found in my research is that there is another interpretation, um, which would be whatever you bind on earth will already have been bound in heaven, meaning that Peter didn't have authority to add things to the Bible. Um, and this is also P Jesus telling Peter to go out and evangelize. Um, so Peter would have the authority to give access to the kingdom because um, he's also talked about giving the keys to him by sharing the gospel um, to different groups of people. Um, so Peter's mission was to give people access to the kingdom by preaching the gospel of Christ. Um, so it wasn't just him deciding, you know, you go and you don't, and I don't like you so you don't get to go. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was more just like, this is, he has the method um, to show people, um, not the authority to show people. So in conclusion, um, it's really interesting um, to see kind of like the meanings can be both symbolic and practical. Um, and how they don't, those don't cancel each other out. Um, and this is in regards to like the unleavened bread and the shoes and stuff like that that we saw in the Old Testament. And it's also kind of a reminder that God works in practical ways, um, as we saw with the story of Joseph last week. Um, it's also interesting to kind of see how something as simple as spacing in the text can change the, the meaning of a text. And it's also um, interesting to see a lot more of the condemnation of the Pharisees here. And, and I really think there's a lot of modern um, Pharisees that need to be called out. Um, people who are creating their own rules for salvation to make themselves seem more righteous and to kind of pit themselves above other people. And that's, um, we're told constantly through the New Testament not to do that. Um, yeah, um, so my question for you is just very simply, do you agree? 
um, with my interpretations, and if not, um, what are your opinions on these passages? And thank you for watching.